Martin. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to this CBC OEI Accessibility Workshop Series. And this is number two, session two. I'm trying to keep up with the muting here. Um, you want to make me co-host, I can mute. Well, I can do that. Let me do that right now so that, where'd you go, Helen? You moved. Say something so you'll come to the top. I'm probably under the H. No, oh, no, you, when you speak, you come to the top, which is great. Okay. Keep speaking. Okay, um, hello, I'm speaking. <laughs> Stacy's also already a host. You can make her, a, let her mute people. Okay, thank you. Well, anyway, as I was saying, my name is Cheryl Chapman, and I'm really happy to welcome you all today to our second session of our accessibility workshop for the CBC OEI at One Entity. And again, great pleasure of mine to be able to introduce Jessica Lopez in a minute, who is one of our amazing students, and I met her through Cosine College, where I happen to teach part-time as well. So we're just gonna go through one quick slide of housekeeping, which you probably are all aware of Zoom etiquette, but I want you to be encouraged to use the chat and we're going to try to follow it as best we can, share your reflections and your resources. And if you wouldn't mind toggling it to everyone so that if you wanna to speak to everyone, that's where it's gonna go. And of course you can do private messages to um, people. Also, we're gonna monitor the chat. And if you would put a question mark, if you have a question, it'll make us, it'll help us identify it quicker. If you put it, what Helen? If Stacy was too quick to mute me. If you put it in front of your question, that makes yeah, it yeah. easier for us to see it. Yeah, I should include before your question, yeah. And then we will pause for questions during uh, Jessica's presentation. And so we'll just monitor monitor it the best we can. Other thing is, sh oh, sorry, shameless plug, our courses are open for spring registration in case you want to share that with your colleagues, faculty, or anyone at your campus. And you can reach that at catalog.onlinenetworkofeducators.org. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jessica Lopez. You can read a little bit about her here or on our website. And I just wanted to preface it by saying the very first time I met her, saw her virtually, it's not even enough to say that you could be impressed, but it was just the, the ease of language that she used to make it understandable for everyone. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm going to give it over to Jessica. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I am going to share my screen. All right. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Um. Well, thank you all for coming. I am so excited to be here and kind of talk to you all and share a little bit about my story and some of the things that I've learned from, you know, my life experiences and, you know, being a student. So a little bit more about me. I am a sophomore at Coastline College. I am triple majoring in business, economics, and communication. I was a former treasurer of Region 8 of the Student Senate for California Community Colleges. And for those who don't know, California Community Colleges has a student senate to basically kind of, you know, lend voices to students who, you know, um, are going through college and want to see changes or want to see things improve, you know, throughout their experiences at college. And I think the most important thing too we can do is to really listen to the voices of students who are currently going through college, um, especially as the world is changing so much, technology is changing a lot. And also I'm a disability rights advocate and consultant. If we didn't, um, Notice, you know, from the picture, I was born without hands and feet, and I'm passionate about building more accessibility and inclusion for people with disabilities who are, you know, a large population of the world and this country. So a little bit more about me um, and my journey. I was born without hands and feet. I also live with chronic illness, and I became chronically ill at the age of 10 years old, and that was completely unrelated to my physical disability. Um, and before I had become chronically ill, I was you know, a very active student. I was in a performing arts school. So I did singing, dancing, and drama. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And 
I was someone who really loved learning. I loved going to school every day and not just to hang out with friends, but to actually, you know, learn. Um, and once I became chronically ill, that really held me back from continuing to, you know, educate myself and grow and learn. And um, I was not able to keep up in school because of that. I found that I was just, you know, when you're chronically ill, it can really keep you from being able to keep up and it can really keep you from being able to be as active, you know, as the rest of the world. And what I found was that the rest of the world was moving on and I was not. And a lot of times I kind of felt like it was, you know, my chronic illness, it was kind of, you know, my body wasn't cooperating. Um, and over time I've learned that in fact, it wasn't actually, you know, my disability or my chronic illness. It was the way the world has been built to not be inclusive for a lot of people who live with chronic illnesses or disabilities or any other number of things, you know, being a minority, et cetera. Um, and my life became a series of doctor's appointments, trying to find a solution to my chronic illness trying to find a way to get better. And I just wasn't able to find that solution. Um, and I was into put into independent education, which was where they would send a teacher out to my house and teach me. Um, but a lot of times my body had its own schedule, right? And it really meant that I wasn't able to meet with my teacher when she was you know, scheduled to meet with me. And when I was building up to it, she wasn't able to come, you know, out to my house. And that meant that that flexibility just wasn't there. So one of the things that was kind of floating around in my head was maybe the possibility of doing online education. At the time, it was not really a thing. You know, I became chronically ill uh, in 2008 and the internet was kind of really barely booming and exploding and the technology just hadn't advanced yet. Um, but I did ask them online, you know, for online education from my uh, school district for several years. And I asked them, you know, every year for 10 years, I asked them, could I please have some way of doing things online? Because I think this would be a really beneficial thing for me to continue in my education. And they just said, no, that's not possible. Well, you know, come around to 2020 and, um, you know, the pandemic hit and the whole world was put into online education within four weeks of, or less. And this was something that I had been asking of my school for years and they just were flat out, you know, denying me and saying that it was impossible. I discovered afterwards that they actually did have an online education program all along and they did not tell me. Um, and that online education program had been established like in 2012. So that was maybe pretty much about eight years of me asking for an accommodation that would have benefited my life and allowed me to continue my education. And they basically, you know, they denied me of that accommodation and they lied to me by saying that they didn't have a program that they did have. And that is unethical, but it's also illegal. It is against the ADA to deny disabled student accommodations, especially if they already have programs established. And what I discovered was that this was always possible. Online education had always been possible. They just weren't willing to provide it for me. And I discovered that through all of that experience, I discovered that it's really important to invest our time in, you know, providing the accommodations that we need for people with disabilities. I ended up completing two years of high school in less than four months because of online education. I was able to graduate high school in 2021 and I was able to go to college. And I didn't know that this would even be possible because my life had been stopped. I graduated high school four years late when I was 20, 20, 22. And my original plan was actually to graduate at 16. And that was something that I was completely ready to do. And I ended up not being able to do that in my life. It took a different turn. And I, looking out at it now, I know that I would have graduated at 16 if I had had the accommodation that I have been asking for all along. And that made me passionate about advocating for students with disabilities who really need that flexibility and that you know accommodation no matter what it is whether it's online education whether it's any sort of you know accommodation they should be given that opportunity to have that flexibility and be given what they need so as we go into this i want to start off with a little bit of a kind of a brain teaser 
So I want to ask you all uh, in it maybe in the chat, I want you to think about this and as we're going through the presentation, kind of think about it, keep it in the back of your mind and we'll come back to it. But I want to ask, what do these things have in common? So we have writing, it's a, you know, a pen. Yeah, we have books, we have a school, we have radio, and we have television. And I'm just curious to kind of see what you all will come up to and kind of put together and um, we'll come back to this and I'll kind of ask you, you know, maybe what do you, what you think these things might have in common. So I'm really passionate about disability um, inclusion because, you know, I live with chronic illness and I was born without hands and feet. And it's really important to really bring these conversations to the forefront because 26% of all Americans live with disabilities. This is the largest minority in the world. There are over 1 billion disabled people in the world. And, you know, this is one in four people who are living with a disability. A lot of disabilities are invisible, like with chronic illness. Other disabilities are not invisible, like, you know, the fact that I was born with our hands and feet. Um, but I think there's a lot of times we don't know this. We don't know that this is a very large minority of people who are, you know, living um, in a world that really doesn't accommodate them or support them. And a lot of times it can be a bit of an afterthought. And I think it's really important to start having these conversations, start talking about disability, start thinking about it as a sociological group that needs to be supported. And a lot of times it's kind of put on the back burner a little bit. In addition to, you know, one in four people being uh, living with disabilities, one in five of all undergraduate students in America live with disabilities. This is um, quite a large population of undergraduate students. Um, and a lot of times we might hear about, you know, there's a lot of children with disabilities, but once you start to grow out of, you know, being 18 and start, you know, going to be an adult, we don't really think about that population as much. We just kind of push them out into the world and hope it goes well. Um, but there are, you know, a significant amount of students who live with disabilities. And a lot of times it's not visible, a lot of times it's not even talked about, but it definitely is a large percentage of students who really need that support. The graduation rate of non-disabled students is around 62%, which is okay, it could be better. Um, but if you look at the graduation rate of disabled students, it is 34%. That means that it is half that of non-disabled students. And this really means that this is a very big thing that is kind of being overlooked in our education system. The fact that there are a lot of students who are just not graduating. Um, and we'll kind of go into the reasons about why this is. Um, this was, these statistics are according to the National Center for Education Statistics. This is um, numbers that are studied by the government. And I also think it definitely should be studied by each institution, um, especially because this is a large minority of you know, students who really need that extra support. And I think we all kind of know, you know, disabled people need more support anyway. So it's kind of, you know, logical to kind of start thinking about what kind of support they need and how we can do that. But when you really think about it, how can you really support them if you don't know why they're not graduating? Well, um, from my experience, I've seen about four different reasons why they are not able to graduate. Um, the first thing is inflexibility. For myself, that was a big reason of why I wasn't able to graduate high school because I just needed that flexibility to be able to study when I'm feeling up to it, take a step back when I'm not feeling up to it. Um, I found that my body has its own schedule and the world has its own schedule, but my body just doesn't fit within that schedule. And that means that school doesn't accommodate health and a lot of other needs. Inaccessibility college and school in general can be inaccessible to those with disabilities. It's kind of, I found that institutions in general are built for an average person. And, but what this means is that there's a wide percentage of people who just don't fit that average. They just don't really fit in any kind of category. And that means that we're kind of excluding so many different kinds of people just because they don't fit that kind of average. And that means that there's a lot of people who are being pushed out of the system like myself. 
The other thing is lack of inclusion. Students don't feel that higher education is accepting of people like them. If you really think about it, higher education was kind of built for one person in mind, and that was, if we're being really honest here, and it was the white, uh, wealthy male, and that was the kind of person that the higher education system was built to support. And that means that even though we kind of moved past that, there are so many kinds of people who are graduating, it also means that it still has a legacy of supporting this one kind of person. And Right now, a lot of times we're doing really great about including so many different kinds of people um, and making sure that more minorities are graduating. But it also means that a lot of disabled people are just not included as, as much as a lot of other minorities. And that's why I'm passionate about kind of bringing that to the forefront and making sure it's not so much of an afterthought. And the final thing is, Overlook, you know, seeing kind of a common theme that uh, a lot of colleges just don't really think about, you know, students with disabilities. I've found that colleges and a lot of institutions, when you think about disability, you just kind of think, well, you know, there's one, you know, department that handles that. And that means that, you know, in the California Community College System, that is that um, the SPS, Disabled Services, um, and they provide support and accommodations for students with disabilities. And that's really very important. But it also means that a lot of times when a disability consideration is brought up, that there's only one kind of department that really handles that. And you know, any kind of thought about thinking about accommodating or including disabled students outside of just that department isn't really thought about. And I think inclusion means it has to be widespread, you know, everybody really needs to be having those conversations, everybody really needs to learn about the lives of disabled students and learn how to support them, because inclusion isn't just siloed into one department, it should be all encompassing, and that means, you know, faculty, it means administration, it means other students as well. So, leading on into, you know, kind of the topic of this um, event is that Online education is really impactful for a lot of students. We've found that there are so many students that have been able to graduate um, who live with disabilities. Um, there's other students that have been able to graduate because they were just able to work at their own pace. Sometimes they can even graduate sooner and earlier because they can work at their own you know, flexibility and what they're comfortable with and what they're able to do. And, you know, I'm kind of probably preaching to the choir here. This is the California virtual campus. So that means, you know, a lot of you probably realize the value of online education. But you might not have thought about what the value of that is in this kind of new perspective. And so looking at the numbers, what do students want? 75% of them want online learning. This is kind of a narrative that often isn't talked about. 25% percent of them don't want online education and that's okay. Um, but it also means giving that flexibility to a lot of students who are really looking for this kind of support. So what would happen if we re-evaluated education? We start looking at education and start moving it into the 21st century into a new format. We kind of had online education for a few years, a lot of times it wasn't really accepted as a valid form of education. And now here we are and we've kind of learned that online education can be doable and it can be, you know, even successful. And, but it really means that we kind of need to shift the way we think about education and start shaping it into the 21st century for a new form of students. You know, students who like me, growing up in the digital age, they've learned how to, leverage technology in a way that all of the generations before had not learned about. And that means that we can also shape education to support that and even encourage that because as we continue on through the generation, technology is only going to advance and it's not really going away, which means that we also need to kind of shape education to fit that. So how do we do that? Well, this is an acronym that I kind of built up, and I think it's really an acronym for any sort of change that you want to see in the world, which is that you need to build momentum towards greater access. You need to move, and you need to build momentum. You need to organize, which means creating more collaboration between groups with disability inclusion. 
I mean, taking it out of Jen's the mindset of, you know, doctors deal, handle with it, or, you know, uh, disability services handle it, or, you know, counselors handle it, and start thinking about how we can have that collaboration between all groups within colleges and within institutions in general. Value disabled people's lived experiences. They're the only experts on their disabilities, what they're capable of. Every disabled person is completely different. And that means that they have different accommodations they might need. They might be able to do things differently. And that means that we need to really value how they're experiencing the world. Because I found that my perspective is completely different from everybody else that I've ever known. And it means, and I found that there's a lot of other disabled people who have very similar perspectives to me. And it is because of our, you know, very unique um, experiences in the world and ultimately emphasizing the disabled student population and their perspectives. It's really important to kind of highlight disabled students and start you know, elevating them as a population that really needs to have their voices heard and shared because that's the only way that they can become more successful. So the benefit of online education is there is unrestricted learning. Learning is no longer localized to like a specific time and place. If you're a working parent, you can kind of do it wherever you are. You can stay at home and, you know, work, you know, with your parents, with your kids there. If you're, you know, traveling, you can also learn. And the other thing is that there are new learning modalities. There are interactive ways of learning, and this is completely new to technology. And before technology advanced, before the internet was around, you kind of only learned a certain way, right, which is, you know, kind of, using textbooks and writing out a lot of papers and now we have new formats of learning and we'll get into that. And I think the most important thing is that online education isn't just plausible, it's necessary for so many people. I would have never been able to be who I am and doing what I am without online education. I would have never graduated high school. I had been only completing one credit per year because I was just unable to do it. And then if you look at my transcript, you'll see it completed, you know, dozens of credits within a very short time period because online education was necessary for my success. The rate of the unemployment rate of disabled people hit a record low due to remote work. And that means that graduation rates have the exact same potential. So you know, now getting into kind of a little bit of why we're here. Um, for those who don't know, Universal Design for Learning is a framework that is basically, it shapes the way learning can be made. It shapes the way professors and teachers can teach and be effective and support as many students as possible. And it's a, a framework that is built upon research. And so how do you build Universal Design for Learning? How do you make this happen? Well, the first step is to re-educate. Spring 2022 had 50% more enrollment in online courses than in person. It might be a little bit contrary to what we might think, especially like we're getting out of the pandemic, people want to go back to work, people kind of want to stop being stuck at home. But the numbers show that there are a lot of students who do want online courses and the numbers are showing that students are sticking with online courses. It also means that we need to show school leaders the value of online learning, just in general, because it's, it's, I think the biggest limitation for the progression of online learning and making sure that it kind of encompasses the way we teach, not just in California community colleges, but within America and how we teach is convincing school leaders that this is doable and plausible and important for a lot of students. The next step is to restructure how we teach. Then um, leveraging competency-based education is really necessary. Um, for those who don't know, competency-based education means that if you're someone who maybe left school and you want to come back to school, maybe you have 20 years of work experience. That work experience can translate into actual knowledge that should be acknowledged within your learning, which means that you can get credit for work that you've done. If you've been a business owner, maybe you're really good at accounting. That means that you can get credit for that accounting because you've been doing it for 20 years, even if you don't have that degree. And that means building more flexibility and pathways to completion. 
I found that you really have to decide what you want to do as soon as you go into college, because if you don't decide what you want to do, you'll end up losing credits and you'll end up having to switch to a completely new map of graduating. And that means that there's not a lot of flexibility. I don't know about you, but I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 18. I think most people don't. Um, and that means that we need to have that flexibility and online education is one way of providing that. The next way of building universal design is research. We need to start conducting dedicated research programs and tracking systems to study online education and underserved students. There's a lot of research that has been done, but it's not necessarily focusing on minorities. It's not focusing on disabled students. And because it is such a large percentage of people, it means that we kind of need to put a spotlight on how the different modalities of learning impact disabled students. That's how we can provide better support for them. And the final thing is standardized. What I found was when I was looking for online education, once I graduated high school, I knew I've been really successful at this. The only way I'm going to graduate college is to have an online education college. The college that I've been doing this for a long time maybe knows what they're doing. And that college actually was Coastline College. What I did was I created an entire list of every college, university, and community college in the country. And I looked at their online programs just to see what they offer, how many programs they offer. Are they just offering one or two classes? Are they offering one or two degree programs? Or are they offering an actual program that is encompassing and gives online students the support they need? And what I found when I was looking through all of those would be that a lot of colleges would say, hey, you know, we offer online classes, come to our college. But when you actually look at the fine print, you would have to go in for testing. If you're enrolling in a college that says they're online across the country and then they tell you you have to come in for testing, that's just not possible. And that's kind of been the fine print. And so what I found is that we need to enforce the definitions of online degrees and hybrid learning. And online degrees should be, in my opinion, if it says it's online, then it should be 100% online. Anything less is hybrid, because that means that you don't have to go in for testing. You don't have to fly across the country into this college that you didn't realize was not 100% online. You don't have to drive, you know, however many hours to complete your, your learning and complete your classes. And that means that we need to standardize how we define online education in general. So moving on to universal design for learning, um, there are several different guidelines for universal design for learning that are based on empirical research, based on studies, based on, you know, trial and error from, you know, people who have done the research for decades to create this, this set of guidelines to help teachers learn how to be accessible, how to teach online education or just normal classes in general, how to teach better and support all students, um, whether they're the normal kind of student or whether they're kind of in the outliers, whether they're kind of a little bit of both. I've found that some students are really good at some subjects and other students are really bad at other subjects and that's normal, but it means that we have to shape how we teach to be inclusive for all kinds of students. So I've highlighted out of the nine or so guidelines, each of those are broken up into, you know, a handful of other guidelines. So I've highlighted around four different guidelines from the Universal Design for Learning Framework that I think that online education could benefit from and making sure that online education will benefit and help students learn the best way. Online education can be really hard for a lot of students, and a lot of times they've found that it's because of the way professors structure or think about education. And I think that if we can sort of shift the way we structure online education, we can help a lot more students be successful in online classes. So the first one is having a variety of learning modalities. We are, have a fortunate way of having a lot of different modules, a lot of different ways of using the internet. We can watch videos, we can use text, we can do we can do whatever it is. We can, you know, play video games. We can leverage all of those different kinds of technologies together 
to be inside the classroom and help students interact with the material that they're learning. It means adapting for all learning styles. It means offering the same content in alternative formats. For example, some students are really good with reading a textbook. Other students are not so good with reading a textbook. You know, they're having to do an online class. They're already reading a lot more than a lot of other students. That means offering videos. It means offering, you know, PowerPoints, offering charts, whatever it is to really offer learning and the same content in alternative ways so that students have the options to learn the way that fits them. It also means allowing for adjustment and alterations. Sometimes students might not be able to do the assignment in the way that they're, you know, they were assigned to do it. For example, a blind student might not be able to create that PowerPoint. That means that you need to adjust and alter that assignment to make sure that you're of course, testing and challenging them, but also making sure that you're supporting what they're able to do and making sure not to limit them just because you think it kind of needs to be in a certain way. The next framework guideline is varied assignments and demands. It means providing visual based assignments. Some students are really good with, you know, you know, different kinds of uh, artistic um ways of providing homework. Uh, it also means providing mastery based quizzes. For those who don't know, a lot of times, you know, like when you were in school, you probably had quizzes and you or you had homework. And once you get the question wrong, you got the question wrong and then you didn't get a point for that question. Mastery based quizzes means that students can repeat the same kind of question over and over and make sure that they get it and then make sure that they're getting feedback. And if they're not able to get it, then they can keep practicing and doing what they need to do to learn and actually absorb that information. And I think mastery brain quizzes is, is wasn't really possible before, but because we have online formats, they can get that feedback. There are programs that can provide that for them. It also means providing base, text based written assignments. You know, there's Apology is a lot of writing and essays anyways, and of course it's all never gonna go away, but it means having a lot of that flexibility. The next thing is increased access to tools and technology. We, I think the most important thing for colleges is to provide online open education resources. For those who don't know, those are basically free textbooks. If, they, for anybody who's done the college, you'll probably know that textbooks are very expensive. They've only gotten more expensive in recent in recent years. One textbook can be two hundred dollars. For those who are disabled, they already are often struggle to make that income. They might struggle to keep up with you know bringing in the work that they need to do, and that means that leveraging online open education resources is vital for their success because it means you're not holding back learning just for a lack of funds. The next thing is to make content, web content accessibility guidelines accessible. This is a guideline that can shape the way we build our website to make sure that we can provide alternative text and image description for people who need those. People who use screen readers can leverage their screen readers and their platform to even access websites, period. And, and if, if you're in an online class, it means you're leveraging text and you know websites all the time. And that means it needs to be accessible to whatever your needs are. And the last thing is leveraging online games and simulations. I think it's really important to start bringing those into how we learn. There is a lot of young people who love video games and a lot of people might be dismayed and be like, no, video games aren't good, but we can use those video games to actually help students learn, then they'll be learning in a way that's natural to them and a way that might be even more fun to them. And they can still get the same benefit as you know, learning how we did previously. The last thing is availability of mixed media. We really definitely need to make sure that we have media that is accessible to people. It means people who live with disabilities, maybe um, intellectual disabilities, learn best in certain ways. It means because we have online education, we can leverage kinds of media that we never used before. We can use text, we can use 
film, the continued speech, art, movement, whatever it is that can kind of make sure that that learning is absorbed into the student. I also think it's really important to leverage interactive content, live Zoom lectures. Even if you're in an asynchronous class, which means that you don't really have to go into a classroom or you don't have to go to a Zoom at a set time, there should still be the ability to have those live Zoom lectures when you need it and when possible from the professor. And the final thing is adding PowerPoints, outlines, text, videos, even social media. And I actually met a professor who uh, was teaching a class on how to teach online. And these people were professors that had only been teaching a certain way and they're in the class and they're learning how to teach in a way that's completely new to them. And she taught them how to leverage social media to actually kind of drive home some of the subjects. And I think that's really important for the younger generation. People younger than me can learn from social media. So moving on to kind of, I think we we'll kind of discuss how can you really, you know, advocate for online learning? How can you make things more accessible, build programs that are innovating online learning in completely new formats? My college, Coastline College, was doing distance learning before the internet existed. My co Coastline College was actually created in the 80s, and what they did was they created a, a college that leveraged TV, and they bought a television station, and they would have their professors go into the television station, and they would give their lectures on TV, a cable station. Students would, read, would watch these videos and watch TV, and they would do their homework and mail it into their professors. Postland College innovated the way we learned, and they started doing online classes in 1998, which happens to be the year I was born. And they started innovating online learning before it was even accepted. And at that time, people were very dismissive. You can't actually learn online. You can't be successful online. You can't like really teach online, how is that possible? And Coastland College said, we can do it, we're gonna do it. And they did it. And they've been doing it for, you know, 20 years now. And it's the reason why I picked them to attend college because they're one of the only community colleges in the country that was built for online distance learning period. And I found that there is not any other community college that I found that actually was doing online learning before the pandemic aside from Coastline, and that's why I think they are really powerful because they are pioneers. They're starting the way, they're teaching other colleges how to lead the way to teach more online classes. But, you know, Coastline was kind of pushed back again. Can't actually do that, you know? If you're transferring a class to a university, will universities actually accept that that student learned online? And will they believe that they actually learned the material that they need to learn in an online format. Well, that's kind of the reason why we kind of need to push back against the myths of online education. And there are four different myths that I've found that are very common around the narrative of why online education is possible. The first one, first one is that online learning is basically teaching itself. It's not necessarily true. Um, the second one is cheating occurs more often online than in person. The next one is you can't teach hands-on disciplines online. And the last one is that you can't interact with classmates. None of these are true, and I'll kind of explain why this isn't true. The first one is that online learning isn't necessarily teaching yourself. It depends on the professor and how they're utilizing the tools that they have. Online learning can replicate in-person interaction. It can be asynchronous and synchronous at the same time. For those who don't know, asynchronous is when you basically, you learn by yourself, you kind of do the textbook, and synchronous means that you have to, you're required to go into the Zoom meeting every week, you know, you have to make sure you show up and they'll be taking attendance and making sure that it's synchronous and that's the only way that you'll be able to learn. But you can leverage both of those things at the same time. So how do you do that? I actually learned quite a bit from my professors. Um, 
The first one is hosting optional Zoom lectures and related homework for extra credit. Last semester, I had to take a remedial math course. I was not very good at math and I really struggled and I was really worried about my ability to even pass college if I didn't pass math. And I was taking a class um, with this amazing professor who was in her 80s. And she, you know, grew up in a world where the internet wasn't really even a thing until, you know, the last few years. And what she did was she hosted Zoom lectures every week. She volunteered in time to do that. She didn't have to do that. The college did not require that of her class or, you know, asynchronous classes, but she did it anyway. And she spent, you know, two hours every week teaching us and going through the classes, going through the homework for that week. And I was able to have that interactive one-on-one -on -one time with her, with a handful of other students who were able to show up at that time and learn from her. I would have not been able to pass that class if she hadn't have done that. And this semester, I'm also taking a class and this professor hosts optional Zoom lectures every week. He asks students, what do you want? And he gives students who attend those Zoom lectures extra credit, which means that there is an incentive to come back and attend these Zoom lectures and it gives students a reason to attend them when, they might, when they're able to and not attend them when they're not able to. And the next one is posting multiple reminders announcements weekly. You're in a normal class, you're basically, you know, you have you're being held accountable because you're literally having to walk around and you know see people and talk to people and you have a class and you have to go in and see your professor. If you don't show up for a couple of weeks, people might look at you strangely and that's a way of holding you accountable. But a lot of times I've found that professors do not give multiple reminders. They don't let you know what's coming up. And what I found was one of my favorite professors she would post an announcement on Monday and she would say, this is the homework you'll have to do. This is what you'll be learning. And this is when it'll be due. And then she'll post another reminder on Thursday. This is what's coming up, the due dates are coming up, and this is what you probably would have done already and what you'll need to be doing next. And I found that having that check-in, making sure that students know my exam is coming up next week is really important because it means you're checking in, you're giving students that community and that support. It's not just kind of, you know, distance the way you're doing it by yourself. And by having those check-ins, just like you would in a normal, you know, in-person classroom, you're giving students what they need and opening up those discussions to be able to have more touch, uh, you know, touch base with their professors. The next myth is that cheating occurs more often online and in person. I found that this actually is not true. Uh, there is actually zero evidence that cheating occurs more often online. Most headlines about increased cheating like through the pandemic are actually surveys about professor perceptions. This means that professors have this idea that cheating probably occurs more often online, but there's no proof of that. There's actually even evidence of less cheating in online courses, and this is according to research from The Conversation, which is a, basically, you know, a magazine that has been kind of creating these kind of conversations. The next man says that you can't teach hands-on disciplines online. You may be thinking, well, you know, how do you learn biology online? You have to go into a lab and, you know, deal with all this stuff. How do you learn you know, geology if you're not going to the class. Well, there are a lot of programs that are available for that. Um, there's Paris in My Lab, Wiley Plus, Lumen Learning, My Open Math, and these are all programs that I have experienced myself that were really great. When I was in high school, I did a biology class and I was able to leverage simulations of, you know, how did, you know, DNA impact future generations. And they had a program where I could actually interact with it through a simulation on the computer. And it's the same way with geology, for example. I took geology over the summer, it was a lab class. They mailed me a box with all the materials that I needed to do the experiment right at home. And that means that you can learn even when you're at home by leveraging different kinds of media. I mean, leveraging home experience, science kits, 3D modules, um, models, uh, simulation, games, and even the metaverse. And for those who don't know, the metaverse is kind of leveraging 
3D um, virtual reality, putting it into accessible hands, you know, having like an Oculus, you know, glasses to leverage 3D interaction. And that means that you can put simulations, you can put new ways of learning into that format. Jessica, I just wanted to give you a heads up that maybe we have another minute or two so we can open it up for questions. Absolutely. Thanks. All right. Um, and then Nick, or last minute, actually. Uh, well, second to last minute is that you can't interact with other classmates. Interaction is based on community building work. We've done pretty well at doing community based work. You know, we've been able to leverage social media, we've been able to create entire communities online. And we can use those same strategies in classrooms as well. So how do you do that? You leverage discussion boards, you increase collaboration, you leverage synchronous Zoom meetings, you maybe put students together, you know, you have a Zoom meeting and you put them together and you have them learn from each other. And you can do that in a Zoom format as well. The last thing, Mint, that I think is the most important myth that we need to really push back against is that online learning is harmful. Studies show no significant difference in grades. It means that students who are in an online class do not have significantly lower grades than a student in the same class in person. Online learning can accelerate education. If you're, you know, a student who's really motivated or, you know, really smart or really even up to it, you can learn at the pace that's good for you. And I was able to do that. I was able to complete two years of high school in a few months because of that, because I was able to do it when I'm up to it and not do it when I'm not up to it. And the final thing is that new media formats are always adjusted to and embraced in time. And that means that we can leverage the new technology that's always improving, always changing, and we can put that into the way we teach and work and live. And you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of corporations that have been doing well at building remote work and building remote cultures. And I had an internship over the summer that was really great at providing that um, culture, even though I was learning at home. So coming back to the beginning, what do these things have in common? And I'm curious to see what you all have said. You know, what do you think these things have in common? Um, some things might be maybe um, they're all media formats. Um, maybe they're, you know, kind of new ways of information. What I found is that these all things all have in common with the fact that when they were new, everyone believed that they were harmful. Everyone believed that they would be bad for you. Socrates famously warned against writing. He said that it would be harmful to your absorption of information. Women who read novels were often accused of hysteria. In an 1883 article in the Sanitarian, a medical journal argued that schools are bad for kids' brains. In 1938, the music magazine, the gramophone, reported that the radio is bad for kids. And we've all heard the stories, you know, TV milk your brains, it's bad for kids. And what we found is that school is not bad for us. Writing is really good for us. Books are really good for us. The radio is really good for us. And TV can be really good for us too if we leverage it the right way. And that means that online education is the new format of information. And right now we might have kind of push back against it. But as we continue and we learn and we improve, we can leverage online learning and it can be good for students. And that's what I'm advocating for because I wouldn't be where I am without it. So I will close this with, with this one quote, which is that breakthroughs happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. And that's what I found in my life in online education. And yeah, I'll open it up to any questions. And it was exasperated by the pandemic, for sure. Well, it looks like um, they were on the right track, our participating audience, when you asked the question first about communication and new ways of learning. And then the other question, I think, was answered about the magazine that you mentioned, mm -hmm. right, the conversation. But the other question was about, well, first, will the research be available to the participants here today 
for um, or your slides or that information about like is 75 percent that they want online learning is that from the National Center of Ed Statistics? I think you said it was, right? Yes, and I'll definitely provide that, um, and I'll send those resources out to you, um, and you all can hopefully have those resources, and hopefully you can advocate for what you learned um, wherever you are as well, because there's a lot of students who will benefit from online learning, like myself. I know my story is not unique. Well, it is unique in that you just gave us a presentation of a, um, a seasoned faculty member, perhaps, mm -hmm. with so much knowledge and from your perspective of how it, how it helped you. But is there anything that you can tell our group that might stand out to you with the way that you're able to, or, or what barriers, maybe one or two little barriers that you've found getting into online education like now it's a little bit better you said but how about in the beginning did you find any barriers that um that you wanted to attack yes i think it's first of all the perceptions are really important to kind of change those perceptions i also think that for myself when i was doing the research in 2020 there were not a lot of online degree programs I'm fortunate to have a community college that was built online, so I'm able to be in student government because they're in an online format. And I'll be transferring, hopefully my goal is to transfer to ASU, where they have built a college around online learning. And I think the most important thing, one of the most important takeaways is to advocate for building community and building entire programs around online learning um, because you can offer one or two classes but there are some people who really need 100 percent online learning and if you can you know leverage the resources that you have there are colleges that have done it well i think it's possible and right now there's a lot of doubt about what is possible and the funding but there are colleges and people that have shown that it's definitely possible so i think the biggest challenge for me was just trying to find an online learning school and it took me a while to find that um, and also just making sure that they're truly 100% online and I didn't know whether they would be 100% online but my college is you know definitely has been supportive in being truthful about making sure that their classes are 100% online um, including exams as well so yeah I hope that answered the question. And in your work with student and anybody, raise your hand if you have another question, because that's all we had so far. But in your advocacy work with other students with disabilities, do you hear anything about um, actually interacting with online materials that they may have had barriers? Because obviously we preach to the choir about, you know, videos and text and, you know, um, the um, ability to use the keyboard and things like that. But what do you hear from your students? I do hear, it depends on the disability, everybody is unique, but there are students who do struggle to access online learning because they're, you know, the websites are not actually 100% uh, um, accessible. It might, be might not be compatible with their screen readers. And to that, I think it's definitely important to leverage disability services and make sure that they, provide websites that are 100% compatible, also provide you know, blind students with compatible screen readers so that they can actually access those websites. And if you have them all together and it comes from a place of learning how these you know, different programs interact and making sure that they're compatible, then you can really mitigate a lot of those difficulties. So we'll keep plugging at it. Um, Sean made a comment that his son is at ASU and I prefer NAU. Okay, I graduated from NAU and work there now. Both are great schools. Thanks for that, Sean. Anybody else that wants to ask a question perhaps, raise your hand, talk to Jessica. I always feel like a radio host. I don't know, it just seems like a caller number three. Are you there? Cheryl, you yes. might mention that we can post the recording and the resources on the web, the series web page. Yes, as soon as um, this recording is complete and it's captioned, that and the materials that Jessica gives us along with the chat, we will post um, right on the website um, at for online network of educators, which I think we'll put that back into the 
and the transcript too. And Bob has a good question in yes, chat. Mom. It's in chat. Okay. You want to ask Jessica oh, I, has for oh, I just say it? Yes, go ahead, say it. So Jessica, uh, I think uh, half this audience will already know the answer to this, but maybe the other half won't. What advice could you give instructors who are building online courses for those students of theirs who can't use a mouse? How can they uh, do that most effectively? That's a hard one. Um, for myself, even though I would bum it out hands and feet, I can use a mouse um, without assistive technology. I can use um, a laptop without any sort of assistive technology. Um, uh, and I've always been able to do that. I can also use my phone um, without any support. Um, so I might not be the best person to ask that, but I do think um, by doing the research, um, consulting with disabled students, hiring disabled people to consult with you, with your college, bringing them into the conversation and even, you know, giving them employment and giving them the opportunity to share their lived experiences you won't go wrong because you're talking to people who have lived that experience. And if you can even, you know, hire disabled people into your disability services department, do that if possible, hire disabled people as much as possible, and they can help you do it um, from their own lived experience. That's really good advice. Um, Sophia, the link to our website is right here. Let me put that back in for this series. And let's see, well, you, you've all been very active in the chat too. Anyone else? Well, I would like to applaud you, Jessica. You did a fabulous job, not that you wouldn't have. And we're very grateful that you were able to come and, and chat with us. And I, I kind of see, I think in the chat, somebody invited you to speak for them too. So maybe we'll have to hook you up. Sean did at NAU. Oh, that's where it is. Okay. You'll be going in, uh, not international, what, across country, kind of. <laughs> kind of. Cross state lines. Um, and we thank you, Bob. We also want to um, promote our third session of this series, which will be December 8th at 1 to 3, I believe. 1 to 2.30, actually. We couldn't do two and a half hours. But we're going to do the accessibility toolbox and Helen, Sean and myself will be there to share some tidbits and also see if we have any um, other tips and tricks from our, our field, our audience. Oh, Lizette, you have a question? Yeah, quick question. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to see, do you have an idea when the research that Jessica presented, that 76% that we were talking about, uh, might be available on your website series, the link that you just posted for us? Um, the research, I'm, I'm a little confused. Um, the slides will be there. So that would be, I would imagine, in a day. I can also, uh, when I provide the slides, I'll also give the research in a, a document, like, you know, a, you know, a, a, web, a Word document as well. So um, they can also put that up there. Because I definitely want, you know, you all, uh, you know, pro probably professors, you know, you definitely need the sources. And that's very important to me as well to provide that. So I'll definitely provide that. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. I appreciate that. I'm trying to get my... Um... Uh, I don't know if any of the rest of you are in this situation. I'm trying to push my my college for you know offering more online courses. So I know I'm going to need to come in <laughs> with as much research to prove my whys for that. So this research you presented to us today uh, would be a great way for me to do that. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you, Lizette. Anyone else? And we're dying question or burning questions out there. So when will you graduate, Jessica? I will graduate. Well, from Coastline, I'll be finished uh, in December 2023, and I'll be transferring to ASU in 2024. I'm taking an extra semester because I am <laughs> triple majoring. Um, uh, so I presume, you know, if all goes well, I'll graduate uh, December 2025. Excellent. Who knows, maybe Sean will convince you to go to NAU instead. <laughs> Very interesting. 
Well, again, I thank you all for coming today. We hope to see you in December. And uh, we'd like to thank Jessica very, very much for all the information that she shared with us and to, to show that there are real students out there that could have real challenges. So we'll see you all in December. Thank you. Thank you.